Hey, how you doing? This is Benjamin Boyce. I wanted to discuss a pamphlet that I was uh, that was shared with me in the context of a state employment. Now, this is being shared with state employees, which deal with young children. That would be public school teachers. And it is a safe space kit, a guide to supporting lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer students in your school. Now, what it's nominally about is anti-bullying. And why would anybody be against anti-bullying? I am not against anti-bullying. I am not for disrespect. I think that you can promulgate the virtue of respect without denying empirical reality and injecting a whole bunch of confusion into the mind of youngsters or taking the confusion that they've garnered from the internet and compounding that with affirmation. You can be respectful to individuals without giving in or submitting yourself to the very bad ideas that are snuck in to this pamphlet. And then once it goes into the brains of the teachers, it will become a part of the soup that young people will be growing up in. So I want to kind of cut to the nugget that's hid within this pamphlet. It's on page 10. Well, it opens up on page 10 and it goes like this, talking the talk. We are a language-based society, and using language is the best way that we learn about new things. First question is, what society is not language-based? Is there such a thing as a non-language-based society? And if there is, then what would it look like? If there isn't, then why do we point that out? Why do we need to bring up that this is a language-based society? Let me tell you why. It's because that this ideology is based on postmodernism. And a certain strain of postmodernism came about through the study of texts and through interpolating this theory that everything in society is a text and that the author itself is dead, that the intentionality is dead in the text, and that you can read whatever intention you want into the text. At first, it feels very freeing that anything can be anything. But very quickly, human beings, normal human beings, non genius human beings and even the genius human beings succumb to anxiety because that means if everything is infinitely interpretable, there's nothing to stand on. Everything is a shifting morass of pretended values. There's no reality there. There's nothing stable there. So once you get into the position of interpreting everything, you quickly grasp a overarching interpretation for everything. And the overarching interpretation that this pamphlet promotes is that there is a privileged class and a non-privileged class, and that society supports and lifts up the privileged or the majority and suppresses the minority or the marginalized. And that in order for you to reverse that, you need to internalize this concept that everything is suppressing the minority, and your job is to interrupt and to dismantle whatever is oppressing this minority, up to and including feelings of being oppressed. Not even the reality of actual quantifiable empirical oppression, but just the feeling of being misunderstood or being miscategorized in some way. So that's why they're bringing up that we are a language-based society. Once they put that down there, then you can start to interpret anything as anything, but specifically in the way that they want you to interpret everything. So we are a language-based society, and using language is the best way that we learn about new things. If you've ever seen a paint strip in a hardware store, think about how many words we use to describe shades of one color. And that's just paint, not people's identities. Ooh. Inuit people have 50 different words for what we call snow. This actually has been debunked. That's actually not the case, that they have 50 words for snow. But to continue, that's because snow is important to them. We need language to talk about gender and sexual identities because it helps people feel seen and validated when they fall outside of people's assumptions. In addition, having the language to describe one's gender identity outside of the gender binary of male-female is liberating and creates community among people experiencing gender 
in similar ways. So what they've done or what they're beginning to do is to separate gender, this concept of gender, from the concept of sex. And they will do this repeatedly, that sex is something assigned, that sex is a social construct, and that gender is the reality. And gender is based on feelings. And people who want to or people who do experience feelings of gender that fall outside of the male and female binary need a whole landscape of new terms. But guess what? The landscape of new terms that come about that distinguish itself from that binary of male and female are always related to the binary. There's the AB of binary, and then there's the non-binary, but the non-binary is in relation to the binary, which just makes it another binary. So they try to escape into this world of infinite freedom, of infinite expression, but because there's nothing that that is actually based on, they're always referring to that which they are trying to escape, and therefore reaffirming that there is such a thing as sex as male and female. And how do we deal with that? And how do we come into an understanding of the social implications of biology? They obscure throughout the whole thing through escaping through this infinite regress of mirrors and shadows that is a part of the postmodern game. Okay. Having the language to describe one's gender identity outside of the gender binary of male and female is liberating and creates community among people experiencing gender in similar ways. It can help people to find sexual identities that expand outside of heteronormativity. What is a sexual identity? What, what is it actually about? Is it about who you are attracted to in a sexual way? First and foremost, should we be pushing these ideas on young children? This was shared in a grade school Right. So should we be pushing and introducing all these sexual identities to children? And how many sexual identities are there? Either you're turned on by this kind of body or that kind of body. Are there sexual identities so-called that have to do with your proclivity to adore a certain race or a, a, a certain uh, a certain sort of dress? If you're into somebody who wears stiletto heels, is that your sexual identity? And in what case or in what milieu is that sexual identity important? I guess on the internet and these forums where you meet up with people who talk about their fetishes? Like, what does that identity actually mean in a social context? In which social context? And is a grade school the proper context for all these sexual identities to promulgate? To continue, we all have the right to have language to define and better understand ourselves. The problem with that isn't that these individuals get to have their own language, it's that in order for them to be understood, everybody else has to use the language too. So it doesn't just stop at infinite individual expression. It has to employ itself. It has to impress itself on everybody else because people need that validation. Because while people are escaping from reality, they need people to watch them because they themselves are no longer tied to reality. And so they have to find people who agree with them and, and build this infinite dream that's not connected to reality. It's all built out of agreement and consent or assent to this freedom from reality, but, and they'll get to that in just a bit, but because it's built out of escaping from something, people will infinitely try to escape and differentiate themselves from anything common, from any sort of normativity, because in essence, this is about revolt. This is about rejection from any form of normativity, because every form of normativity it privileges the majority and it marginalizes the minority. And that in and of itself creates a dynamic where we have to always be attacking the majority. We always have to be attacking that which privileges the norm or any sort of norm. So what you're going to have is people removing themselves from physical reality, entering into this community of consent or assent to this ideology, and then constantly trying to remove themselves further and further and further. And that's what is behind the next sentence in this pamphlet. To quote, language is forever developing. The beauty of identity exploration is that folks are finding new ways to put words to their experiences every day. An important action to build allyship is to continually educate yourself on new and updated terms that LGBTQ students are using to define themselves. 
So this, this world that's apart from reality is no longer tethered to something that develops in time with reality. It's, it's severed from time. It's in this infinitely mutating, infinitely free, and infinitely chaotic continuum that has nothing that restrains it. There's no limiting principle there. It will continually and constantly be changing. So what you're supposed to do as a good ally is invest more and more and more of your time into what? into what are you actually doing? Just affirming these students. And you're not actually calming them down. You're not actually helping them learn about reality. If they spent all their time studying physics, studying even history, studying even literature and the ability to play around with stories, even that, if they invested as much time and energy into mastering a craft, instead of playing around with their gender, at the end of your time with them as a teacher, they will be much better prepared to be independent individuals that can actually make their way in the world instead of playing these mind games with themselves and each other. If you can mold the way children view and you mold it in a way that's not based in anything real, you can control them. You can control basically how they go forward in life in the way they think. I mean, I don't think it's just, it's about only gender, right? It's about also this larger anti-scientific theme that feeling is more important than reality or objective truth, that there maybe is no such thing as objective truth. And so once you teach children these things, they really are dependent on you, I think. You're not giving them the tools to think. They're dependent on you to tell them how to think or what to think. Then they go on to this graphic called the gender triangle. And there's these three categories. Well, there's these four categories. There's attribution, how you are perceived by others. There's your body, how your body exists and changes. And then there is your expression, how you present yourself. And in the midst of all of these things, this, this uh, trinity, is your gender identity. And it exists, tellingly, in your brain along with dreams, along with your anxieties, along with a whole bunch of thoughts that don't necessarily match up with the world, right? It is completely stored in your imagination. And for some reason, that imaginary thing called gender that's not tied to your body or only tertiarily tied to your body, but also tied to how people see you and also tied to how you express yourself, that gender identity is the basis of everything else. So GLSEN and Interact developed the gender triangle as an educational tool to highlight the main components that revolve around gender identity. Our bodies, how we use our bodies to express ourselves, and how the world around us reads our bodies based on the cultural and social codes, key telling postmodern word there, codes, of our time and place. First, everyone has a body. And how our bodies exist and develop over time is unique. Actually, it basically falls into these two categories called male development and female development. Every once in a while, there is some sort of problem in that code of the actual body that it develops in a different way, and that's called intersex, and there's various different conditions. But by and large, for almost everyone, your body will take a unique development in a male path or in a female path. And of course, it's so complex of a system that everybody does it at a different time or in in different ways. Some people have bigger breasts, some people have hairier chests, right? But they basically are either male or female. To continue, although ideas about gender are often imposed on our bodies, what is gender? It's not something that arises from the body, it is imposed upon the body, and that imposition, it's an imposition. It is in and of itself, oppressive. It's a normativity, and you need to resist that. And if you don't believe me, this is based on queer theory. And it's always about constantly upsetting these norms. To continue, although ideas about gender are often imposed on our bodies, facial hair attributed to manhood or chest development to womanhood, these physical traits do not always inform our identities. Instead, assumptions are made because of how others interpret our bodily characteristics. Upon birth, we are typically categorized into one of two genders, boy or girl. So right now, gender means sex. Upon birth, we are typically categorized into one of two genders, boy or girl, male or female. And that observation is based on actual reality. 
right? That is an observation of the actual physical reality of your body, depending on how our genitals are read. Throughout our lives, however, to continue, our many bodily characteristics work together to create a unique path of development, either male or female, causing some of us to grow really tall but not changing your sex, and others to remain short, but not changing your sex, or some of us to grow hair under our armpits and legs, while others remain bare. That doesn't necessarily have to do with your sex, either being not male or not female, but something else. While this development often happens on its own during puberty, this change can also be administered through medicine, such as hormone replacement therapy. Okay. This is the plug, right? Okay, so there's all these different things. The body does its thing, but you can also do something to your body with these handy dandy medical procedures that we have. It, it, it's sneaking in through the door very sneakily. The idea, it's planning the idea that you don't have to go along with your body. You can change your body to suit what you feel you want your body to be. And who does that ultimately benefit? the drug companies and the doctors, and who ultimately pays the cost? The individual who spends their time and their money pursuing bringing their body up to an ideal that exists in their head that's based on gender but is not actually rooted in sex. It's rooted in your feelings. Anyways, I just wanted to point out that they're slipping in, that yeah, there's this natural development, but we're humans, we're modern, we can do whatever we want. To continue. Since our society often conflates our bodies, or genitalia, with our gender identity, it is critical that we allow space for people to self-identify. They started with the physical reality, that the doctor observes the sex of the child, and that sex, that observation is based on material reality. It's based on objective reality. And now they're saying, but society itself conflates that sex with our gender identity identity. So they started with the word gender when they mean sex. And now they're taking that word gender and they're bringing it up into another realm of meaning, meaning your identity. And what is that identity actually based on? What is that concept of gender actually made out of? To continue, hopefully they tell us that. Some may feel that their bodies are distinct from their gender, while others feel that the two are interrelated. Let's read that again and swap out one word. Some may feel that their bodies are distinct from their selves, while others feel that the two are interrelated. That goes to say that they are bringing us into this dualism where the body, material reality, is distinct from ourselves. And in order for that identity that's not based in reality to matter, it needs to be affirmed by other people. So the weight of evidence is no longer based on reality, it's based on observation of other people agreeing with you. And then they throw up this diagram that doesn't make really any sense about secondary sex characteristics, and we'll kind of skip that because it just like kind of throws a bunch of words into a bunch of colors and circles, and it's not based on science. This is just based on these diagrams that these people came up with in order to promote a certain way of thinking. And they hide this all. Again, they hide this all under the aegis, under the shield, under the guise of anti-bullying. So to resist this is automatically on the surface of it to promote bullying. If you don't go along with this, you're a bad person and you are causing harm. This whole ideology, the wrapping this in this container that you cannot refute, because to refute that is to hurt and to promote the oppression of children. And why would you ever want to do that? Well, the way to combat that is to ask yourself, is it more respectful to a child to be honest with reality and how reality works? Or is it more honest to go along with what they want reality to be? Is it more honest and respectful and better for you as a person who is a teacher to promote understanding of reality or rather to promote understanding or the existence within this infinitely malleable realm of language and affirmation and feelings? What's more important? What serves the child more? What, what leads to a better outcome? To continue, finally, gender identity sits at the core of this triangle to demonstrate that gender identity is how you see yourself at your core. So, gender identity is actually your soul. 
We're actually talking about your soul, the classical conception of yourself, your true self that's at the core of all your being. And instead of being a soul, it's a gender identity that is connected to all this language, right? But also connected to all your feelings. It's This is a religious belief. This is a ontological, metaphysical belief system that is being smuggled into schools. If this was a Christian tract, it would be kicked out of schools. Instead, it's about LGBTQ rights, right? So we have to accept it in order to be accepting. You have to accept this. But underneath all that rights, if you get away from all that anti-bullying, basically that's the sheep's uh, clothing, and you get down to the wolf's too. It comes down to this belief that your gender identity, quote, is how you see yourself at your core. Everyone gets to decide their gender identity for themselves, and this designation can also change over time. So it's not stable. So even yourself, it's not stable. So your true identity, you get to choose whatever you are, and you get to change at any time. So it's, it's very freeing on the surface, but it's a recipe for chaos because it's not tied to anything concrete. To continue, you may identify as a girl or boy, man or woman. You might identify as a gender, gender queer, non-binary, or just as a person. You may choose not to use any specific term to define your gender identity, or you may use a term today that you decide later doesn't fit. Everyone can identify however feels right to them, and our gender identity, as our internal sense of self, is indisputable. So, it's infinitely changing. It's not tied to any sort of concrete reality, and you can never argue with it. One person can never, ever disagree with it. If you say you're a girl, you are a girl. If you say you're a boy, you're a boy. This is all about assertion. And therefore, because the assertion isn't rooted in reality, it has to be rooted in other people's perception. Ultimately, this is giving up Ultimately, this is giving up your sense of self, giving up your individuality, giving up your volition, and giving it to other people, because you have to have other people accept you for who you are, because you are not anything but being perceived and accepted. And this last little section shows you how it makes sense. Now that they completely destabilized everything in a postmodern term, where everything is interpretation, you can be whatever you want, and that can change it any day, and nobody could ever argue with you. You should always get your way, and you should always get to say what you are. Uh, well, that, that leads to a realm of utter alienation and isolation. Everybody belongs to everybody else and everybody's all completely alone because they're left only with their feelings and their assertions. Okay, so how do you stabilize this entire system? This is how they stabilize it. They stabilize it through conflict theory. Quote, the more all of these aspects align, the more you may identify as cisgender and experience cis privilege. For example, if you identify as a boy with bodily traits and expressions that are attributed to masculinity within your culture, that's a mouthful, then you experience privilege. So if everything aligns and everybody sees you as aligning with everybody else, you automatically are privileged. You automatically have it easier and you're at a better position. Okay, that's the main component of the teeter-totter. There's going to be a low end in order for us to go along and teeter-totter. And that's where the reality, the stability of this entire made-up system is going to rest upon. That access is oppression and the overcoming of oppression. To continue, cisgender people often get to move through the world without thinking about gender. Oh, God, what a relief would that be? Since gender could be anything... I don't have to think about it anymore because I'm cisgender. I can just be myself. I can just go along and, you know, learn to write, learn to make a good video, learn to, like, build a machine, learn to ride my bike. I get to learn things in the world instead of thinking about gender. Oh, jeez. Cisgender people don't have to think about gender. They don't have to worry about being misgendered or feeling limited by gender stereotypes. Those who find tension among these four components, and to review them, they are attribution, expression, your body, and your gender identity. 
those who find tension among those four components, otherwise known as those who obsess about those things, then they may identify as transgender. Transgender often serves as an umbrella term for a myriad of other gender identities, such as non-binary, genderqueer, or agender. In working with youth, it's important to reflect on our own gender and consider the privileges we hold. Doing this is an important step towards understanding the many parts of our students' identities to ultimately create safer and more affirming schools for all. I think ultimately, this is my thesis, ultimately it does not create a safer and more affirming school. Ultimately, it creates a chaotic realm of identity that's always shifting, that's always changing, that people are constantly obsessing with, and that this gender identity stuff, this gender identity is a maladaptive religion. I, I believe that religion is a very important thing in spiritual development and conscious work and mindfulness and, and the various different psycho psychological practices and philosophical schools that come with really thinking through very carefully what I am, how do I live a good life, all that stuff fits loosely within the realm of philosophy, of wisdom, traditions, and of religion, is all being maladapted into this obsession over gender. The gender is a revolt against reality, and it's built completely out of language, and it's this creative free-for-all that relies ultimately on people being seen as they want to be seen, and obsessing more and more about this stuff. And instead of thinking about something in the world that they can do, they're thinking about something in their head that they can be. Identity ultimately doesn't serve us. It's a fun little thing that we play around with. It should not be the defining characteristic of our lives. And for schools to implement this stuff, or to schools to unwittingly promote this stuff and their desire to make a more accepting environment is ultimately a disservice to the students. So with regards to anti-bullying, you can teach respect for individuals and their wild uniqueness and even their crazy ideas. You can promote respect without implementing ultimately a very unstable, destructive ideology. Those two things don't have to be put together and they need to be separated furthermore. And the chaff needs to be put out of the schools. Get this out of the schools. This does not belong in schools. If you want to believe this on your own time, if parents want to believe this on their own time, it should not be implemented where everybody else has to go along with this stuff. Because ultimately, it doesn't serve everybody. It actually creates a lot of confusion and a lot of mess, and it doesn't actually promote <laughs> any sort of skills in the world. That's my thesis. I felt like I repeated myself a whole lot, but that's okay, because at the end of this video, there is a kitty. I would like to introduce you to Bodhi. was a musician. <laughs> They're the worst. Dropped out of school, followed down here. Started flush at the beach, ended up downtown. Panhandle. 